Um, so the next part of data generation is actually uh, resampling. So resampling basically allows us to take the data we actually have and um, it's called uh, repurpose it to what we need it to do. So um, imagine you have the sample, whether it's uh, generated yourself or more likely it's some real life data. Let's say we want to use real life data and we don't want to use a generated stuff. We want to use the stuff that we actually have. Well, it might be useful for us to do a resampling um, for one, to make the data more normal because it's a central limit theorem, right? But the other part that we can use pre-sampling for is also to generate new data so we can do our, um, basically have more data than we actually have. So if we only have like 100 data points, we can use this to do multiple tests by generating um, basically repeated data over and over, okay? So uh, for example, I have made the sample here where I'm just making up a new sample. You can pretend this is real data. But basically, it's just giving some extra noise plus uh, pi divided by three. Okay, so let's see here. If I just kind of show you a little bit what the sample looks like, you can see here. It's um, if you look at what what's pi divided by three, it's about one, right? So if I do pi divided by three, you can see here that's about almost one, right? But you can see here with the sample, sometimes it's a little bit above one, sometimes it's a little bit below one. It's adding that extra noise within here, okay? And it's doing this 100 times, okay? So this is allows us to do this generation of data. Um, now, the way we can kind of sample through this, resampling basically, is we can do two different methods, bootstrap or jackknife. Bootstrapping um, is more common. Um, it's kind of like the newer one. Um, it basically allows you to pick out random samples. And basically it's kind of like you have a, um, a jar of like, you know, like let's say a jar with a bunch of little pieces of paper of your data samples. And you take one out and you pick one out and you're like, okay, it's data, you know, 1.737. Okay. And then you write that down and you put it back in the hat or the jar and you shake the jar again and you pick it up again and you say, okay, this is, you know, 2.03. And that's your data set. So you might do that a hundred times to create a data set of a hundred. So you might have some repeats. In fact, you probably expect to have some repeat, repeats, but it allows you to do some quick sample. So it's basically generating a sample from our sample. Okay. And um, this is a quick, basically example or coding example of this. It's basically all you would just do is a random choice of the sample that we have up here. Okay. And we just say how big of a size we want it. In this case, we actually want to keep it the same size. So in this case, we had a hundred we'll have 100 here. We could have simply just put like 50 here and say, okay, we only want a smaller sample of this. And then replace equals true, basically so that way we keep picking out from the same pool over and over and over again, okay? And so we do this part. Uh, now we have this new sample here and um, you can actually, like if I were to try to look for this part, I'm not gonna go through it really quickly, but you can basically, if you were to go through this, you can see there's some doubles like this one right here and this one right here, um, which, you know, happens, you know, if you get enough, big enough sample. Um, but the point is basically you will have now a random sample every time you run this through and it's derived directly from your original, you know, um, sample here, right? And so you can see here is that you can also just use resample from sklearn. So there's an alternative to it. And you can just basically resample and it does the same exact thing in the sense of doing a random choice. Um, and you can of course pass different parameters to get whatever you want, okay? So Bootstrap is really nice because um, it's quick, it's not quick, it's, um, it allows you, it, I think it's intuitive and being like, oh, I can resample this over and over again and I'm making a new sample from my original sample. Um, it's, it's kind of like, again, the central limit theorem. Um, there is another older way, which is called jackknife. And jackknife is, I think, a little confusing at first when you think of it, but basically um, the benefit of the jackknife is that it will give the same output every single time. So with bootstrapping, you're randomly picking it out. And so you're gonna get a different output every time. Like I run this over and over again, you will find that this will be um, a different, um, this one right here, you'll find that this will be a different sample, data set sample every time. So Jackknife allows us to basically do this over and over and over, or do this over and over again, and it would always get the same result. So what we do essentially is we take our sample, like this is our whole data set here. And I'll make it a little bit smaller just for us to kind of more easily um, visualize this is that you can see here there's 10 samples and what jackknife will do is basically will essentially will make one sample let's say we want to make one sample from jackknife it will include um, this part 
this part, this part, this part, everything except this one. It won't include this last data point. And then we just make the second sample. We would go this part, this part, this part, up to this one, skip over this, and then include this. Okay. And then you might do the same thing, essentially. It'll include all of these except for this one right here, and then include these two. So basically, you keep skipping over one. Um, you cut out each one, and that's your sample, which I think it's one of those things where you're like, that doesn't seem like it would be very good at giving a sample, but because we're doing it um, so many times, if you give like 100 different samples from this, you actually get a pretty decent estimation of your population. So the way you would code this is uh, right here. So this is one, I think I gave two different examples. No, I just gave one. Um, basically, you can basically go through the whole sample and you can see here, I'm bringing the first part, which is the random sample going from the very beginning to whatever I is. In this case, we'll skip over the first one. Okay, And then I skip over that part and go to the end. So basically, each sample will be one less than this. Um, note that you can also remove multiple. So if I wanted to have, I wanted to remove two samples each time, I would change this to two. I'm oh, sorry, not samples, two observations each time. I could just skip over two or I could skip over one. I could skip over five, it's a very large data set. And this allows you again to re basically do a resampling of the original data set and be useful in that way. So you can see here, um, oh, this should be a sample. I'm gonna put random sample here. Please. Let's see how I changed up. So we'll do something like 50 data points. Okay, so you can see here, oh, that's, oh, yeah, it's okay. So you see you have a random sample here, just a random data. You can imagine this is data we collected at some point. Okay. And then we'll do a jackknife. And so this will basically resample it over. And we can see here is that now we ran through this part. We can now actually check out, for example, um, the total. So we can actually see like if our sum is going to be equal to this actual sum. So this is where the central limit there comes through. So note that basically I'm just adding up everything here and then I'm dividing it by the size of each sample. So just to kind of emphasize what this looks like. So jackknife free sample, you can see here, each one of these examples will have 49 elements in it. And you can see here, I do this 40 or 50 times, but I have 50 samples with 49 um, observations in them. So for example, if I do, well then here we'll see that this will be 50, so only 50 examples. Okay, and then you can see if I do the first so, um, resample in there. You can see there's only 49 of them. Okay, so you can see here if what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the total right here. Basically, I'm going to add up everything in there. So I'm going to basically add up the total within um, each, you know, um, resample, and then add up the total of all of that, and then average over that whole thing. And what we'll see is that that will actually be close to the actual value of pi, depending if you have enough um, data points in here. You can see here. Oh, this is a list. Where are you? So I'll just do a list of this. You can see here is our diff. Oh, because it's empty. Average of averages. Sorry, I changed some code, I think, at some point. So I think that's part of the reason why. But mm, so our total divided by, oops. <laughs> That's why, len. Okay, you saw that in the air and said, "No, nah, just gonna let it go." <laughs> I did see. <it. laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> um, so you can see here is that basically this is the total average. If I did, let's say, average of averages, and let's just print that out. You can see here that's the number that it estimates to be um, this thing, which is n pi, like the value. And you can basically see that that's really close to the actual like difference. It's only off by 0 0.013. If I increase this instead to something like 500 data points, okay, and I won't run that part again. I run this whole thing over again. Hopefully this might take a little bit of a while because um, it's more points. But you can see here is that this should be closer to, I think it was 1.04 was the actual value of pi. Um, I did notice that sometimes my computer for some reason gets a little stuck on here because it's not super efficient. Um, usually with these resampling methods, you would use something like C. And you can see here, 1.039, that's pretty close to the actual value. So basically we're resampling over our sample over and over and over again. 
um, which allows us to get closer and closer to the value of what we're looking for. So this is an example of when you would use this. Okay. Um, any questions on that jackknife versus bootstrap? Um, anything at all? Okay, thumbs up, thumbs down on that. Kind of sideways. Yeah, I think um, any questions like why you would use this? Is that maybe? Well, yeah, I don't know. It's, I don't know, it seems kind of confusing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the resampling, it is kind of like, I think the hard part is like a sample of a sample, which can be super like, like, wait, what? Like, why are you doing this? Um, basically know that we can do, we're trying, we might do this to like, make sure we have a normalized um, set of samples. So if you recall back to the central limit theorem, basically the central limit theorem says is that with any population, no matter what the population distribution actually looks like, whether it's Poisson distribution, normal distribution, it could be random. But if we basically take subsamples of that distribution, we will get a normalized um, distribution of samples. So it's kind of like, yeah, like um, <laughs> it's a lot of like sample of samples, I think kind of throws it off. But um, bootstrapping basically allows you to make that sample of samples. And jackknife is just another way of getting that sample of samples. The reason why we might use jackknife is because it's more computationally efficient in some cases, because you're not randomly doing it. You're not using extra memory to store this. Essentially, your memory is just storing the original data sample. And then just like you can basically, um, you can make this more efficient to basically say, oh, only look at, you know, this part of the, the data set. Look at only this part of the data set, because this part of the data set versus bootstrapping, you have to create a new, like, sample from the original sample, store that, and store that one, and store that one, and store that one, so it can take more of space. Versus Jackknife, you can essentially just say, all right, keep the original data set, and just know, computer, when we ask for the sample, we really just want to say, just remove that middle one. So it's a little, it's a lot quicker to actually do that. Um, to be honest, it's a little on the older side. Most people don't use Jackknife as often. Um, most people are using Bootstrap in this case, okay? Um, and that's the real reason why we're doing that. And there's other techniques. This is a paper. Um, funny enough, I, I was researching, like, oh, I wonder if I could explain this a little bit better, um, or other ways you can kind of explain it. Um, I was kind of doing some research, and the first thing that came up was actually my physics professor back in college, um, who's in computational physics. So there's this paper here. The warning, there's a lot of um, more mathematically based, but basically saying like why this is useful. And basically you can do something which will lead us into permutation tests. You can basically use this um, part to determine how far off your um, error bars are, basically your variance of your actual um, sample. And so you can see here at the very bottom here is, um, where is it? Jackknife. So this kind of explains a little bit of like, you know, the mathematics of why this can work. Um, which I think in my mind, I'm like, it seems like this shouldn't work. <laughs> like, I don't know, it just seems like this seems, like this seems more reasonable. Jackknife just seems more like, how is that even possible? But if you look at the mathematics, you can actually get a pretty good variance from it. So this leads us to permutation tests. And the permutation test itself is, um, I like to think of it like backwards confidence intervals. So when we do a confidence interval, what we're really saying, say 95% confidence, what we're really saying with that is saying that if I were to repeat this test a hundred times, I would expect the average that I found or that I care about to be within this range, 95 out of the hundred tests. And that's really what a confidence interval is. So what we do instead essentially is working backwards on this and saying, well, instead of determining, you know, is our test within this confidence interval, we say, let's determine our confidence interval or essentially the p-value from the variations. So this is kind of like what we do essentially is that we will, um, so like the way you can imagine this, you have two different populations, A and B, okay? So the first thing you would do is say, okay, what is the actual population of A? What's the actual population, or sorry, what's the actual mean of A? What's the actual mean of B? Okay, and record those parts. Then what you would do, you would find the difference of the means between all possible ways of splitting the samples, which is a whole I don't know, when I say that, it sounds very complicated. Basically what you're saying is that like, okay, we're going to do all the possi possible ways we could have 
out of all the population an A, an A set and a B set and say, okay, um, how much does that differ from the actual A and B averages? So we kind of take the A and B averages to be like the truth and say, well, what if we were to redo this um, test where you just stick everything, like all the people from A, all the people from B, mix them all up and just randomly put them to A or B and see all those different possibilities and all the different averages we could possibly get. And then say, okay, like this first sample, we mix them all up. There's these points are in A, these points are in B and you subtract the different, or you find the averages and say, okay, how much were these averages different from the A and B originals? Okay, and you do that over and over and over again. So this is kind of the idea of like, um, basically reconfiguring or reconstructing that confidence interval. And so once we have that part, does that make sense, Eric? Um, like, like maybe not necessarily why we're doing it, but like, like how that is actually functioning is, um, we're essentially just trying to say like, I guess, you know, maybe I should draw this out a little bit. So if we have like, let's say this is population A. But I guess why would you mix the samples though? Because mm -hmm. is that what you're doing? Yeah, so I know it seems like, like well, what, what's the point of that, right? And the reason why is we're trying to see like, if it was purely luck that A and B happened, you know, yeah. what, Sure. Like you're basically trying to say like, what is the probability of us actually observing this random chance? So if that makes sense, um, let me see if I can undo this part. So like if I have population A, and this is population B. So let's say this is like the ground truth. This is actually true, right? And that's kind of what we're assuming. So we have like, you know, let's say 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And then we'll say like, you know, this is, I don't know, 0.1 and 0.2. And then essentially it's like, well, what ways we could do is like, well, we could have said A is like this, A is like this. And we'll say like, okay, what will, there could be one here, there could be one here, but maybe what we actually find in this set is like, oh, well, actually it turns out that this one was here and this two stayed in here. And then I have the red one, I got rid of my color, but, or red two. So you can see like this could be a possibility. So basically you're, you're kind of working backwards. Like if you think back in hypothesis tests, we take two samples like in a t-test and say, how likely is it that these samples are actually the same? And instead what we do is something different is to say, well, okay, can we recon reconstruct this p-value um, from instead of going from saying, well, how likely is this difference? Like, well, if this is the truth, what is the probability of us like, what are the chances of us actually getting this specific point? So it's kind of like reconstructing this probability in a different ways. So permutation tests are very similar to hypothesis tests. Just the way they approach it is essentially like the backwards part. So in a lot of ways, you would do a like a t-test or a z-test. You essentially would have a p-value and say, okay, does my z-score fit within this p-value? And instead what you say, what's the p-value I would need like essentially what's the PLU I would need to say that the, these are actually different from each other. And that's what you're calculating here is that probability that the difference of the means actually are different enough um, from that difference of samples. So it's kind of, it's a little subtle, which hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. But a lot of times like we have that critical value. Okay, good. give me a thumbs up. So um, yeah, essentially in that t-test, z-test, those hypothesis tests, we have we start with a p-value that we want. In this case, permutation test, like what's the p-value that we would need to have to actually say these are different? So it's subtle, but it does um, change a little bit. It's hard being the only one here. You just- I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can, to answer. I, I like to think like, if this was ever like a lecture hall too, like it'd be like me talking to you like individually like in a lecture. Um, I feel so. like, I feel like I have to understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's an advantage, I guess, to you too, right? You get to kind of go through it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, hopefully that kind of helps a little bit and go in a little deeper. So that's really what we're doing jackknife and bootstrapping is the ways to resample. Um, and one way you can kind of see this is also really to permutation tests is that, for example, if you don't want to do every single possibility, it's possible maybe to do bootstrapping and jackknife from there.